Some of you have copies of this. It's a reading about promises. Leanne Martha Maikez Laroya is actually a financial planner. But I found this, and I'll explain how I found it a little bit later, but for now I'll just read it. Promise is a big word. It either makes something or it breaks something. So these are promises to self. One, I promise myself that I will accept my strengths as well as my flaws. Two, I will speak lovingly to myself. Three, I will always keep in mind that I cannot control everything. Four, I will choose my battles wisely. Five, I will forget the pains of the past, but remember their lessons. Six, I promise to myself that I'll maintain a stable peace of mind. Seven, I won't compromise my values for anything. Eight, I'll learn to live in the moment. Nine, I promise to let go of the things that are holding me back. Ten, I will stay motivated to pursue my innermost dreams and strong passion. And eleven, I promise myself to always see fun and fulfillment in every activity I partake in. Well, think about that. I googled promise to self this week. 160 million hits registered. It would seem that making promises to ourselves is a big deal and a big business for life coaches, therapists, personal trainers, and financial planners. But the astronomical hit number of hits also implies that we aren't really very good at keeping those promises that we do make to ourselves. Otherwise, why would we have to be reminded of them 160 million times in 0.82 seconds of searching? Perhaps it's human nature. The concept of promise-making and promise-breaking is certainly a theme in the Hebrew Bible. If there is a storyline woven through the various books written across centuries, it is a tale of covenants made, broken, remade. It begins with Genesis, when Yahweh promises to care for Adam and Eve if they obey one simple little law, which they don't. So they're cast out of the Garden of Eden where all of their cares and needs are taken care of as punishment and they have to learn how to fend for themselves in a difficult world. With Abraham, Yahweh makes a new promise to the Hebrew people, but in time their sinfulness voids the deal and God sends a flood. Then He promises Noah He will never flood, or maybe I got the order wrong, But then he promises Noah that he will never flood the entire earth again and offers the rainbow as the symbol of his promise. But apparently, however, a subclause in the contract allows for periodic regional flooding in India, Texas, Louisiana, and Quebec. It appears that God has very talented lawyers. Just saying. The Bible is shot through with covenants made and broken and remade. It is a book on mending relationships, on making and breaking, promise making and breaking does indeed to be a big part of human nature. We are always doing it. Now, the concept of making promises to self, this month we're going to look at promises to self and then promises to community and then promises to the wider world in this month of services. And the concept of making promises to self is as old as life. Through natural instinct, as well as parental, cultural, and religious training, we have a good idea of how we really should behave toward ourselves and towards others. Be nice. Be respectful. Be moral, however that's defined in the times in which you live. Work hard. Raise children to the best of your ability. Support the community. These concepts tend to be ageless and perhaps 
are an innate part of being human. And most of us know where we fall short on achieving those goals. We come equipped with a good grasp of our shortcomings. And if we don't, there are always friends and family members and people in our community who are only too happy to point out our flaws to us. In the face of internal and external criticism, we resolve to do better. We make promises to ourselves about all kinds of things. And some of those promises melt away the minute the criticism stops. Some are made under duress, and no matter how fervently spoken in the moment, a clear examination of conscience shows that we were never really serious about them at all. Now, other promises are simply unrealistic. They don't take into account the many complex factors that shape our lives. A promise to self to get up earlier and start the day fresh might be thwarted by something like sleep apnea, or nighttime anxieties. A promise to pay all our bills and get our financial house in order might fall before the reality of a layoff or a compulsion to shop rooted in some other kind of deep need. A promise to do better at work might be undermined by finally admitting that actually we really hate this job and feel trapped by it. We may have a great vision of the person we would like to be, but we also can be a little light on our ability to see ourselves as we actually are. We fail to see the, the disconnects that can get in the way of our promise keeping. To serve the vision, we make promises that will bring us quickly into the rosy light of near perfection. But one concern has to be the vision that is not ours, but is thrust upon us by family expectation or by peer pressure. Maybe the worst promises we ever make are in that latter category. And I'm thinking particularly, but not exclusively, of our children who are exposed to all manner of directives about how they should look, meaning body shape, how they should dress, what it takes to act as cool, how they're supposed to behave in a crowd. Promises get made, sometimes aided and abetted by parents, sometimes in opposition to parental guidance. And the child fails and may well fall into self-loathing and deep anxiety and put themselves into real peril. Promises to self have to be made very carefully. Not spur of the moment and definitely not to please somebody else. Since they are promises to, to the self, they must come from the self, from the heart. They have to be promises we really want to keep. Promise is a big word. You'd either make something or break something, writes Leanne Laroya. We who love people who make unrealistic promises to themselves have to find ways to stand by and support them when they start to fail. Now, supporting people through failure is a big part of most religions. Of course, a good many religions also revere the impossibly high standards that few merely humans can ever achieve, but maybe that's the topic of another sermon. No matter which belief system you consider, there is a common core. First, there's a standard of perfection named. We're not really expected to reach that standard, but we are expected to aim for it. Mostly, religion actually expects us to fail to hit the mark. That's kind of one of the ways that religion perpetuates itself. It's one of those darker things we don't like to mention. Yes, we like to comfort people in their failure, but also a lot of religious communities are kind of invested in that failure. That's what keeps people coming back. Religion then provides the faithful with the means and the methods to get back on track. And perhaps it's making amends or doing a penance of some kind or confessing our failures or meditating. Those actions are intended to help alleviate guilt and to free us up emotionally to pursue the path to betterment, to recommit to our promises. 
Most spiritual forms work at exploring the meaning of those promises and reinforcing commitment. In the common vernacular, we call our approach to such things spiritual disciplines. And the very word discipline implies a couple of promises. The first is to take up the practice religiously. It's a promise to do the work. And the second promise implied is about betterment. It can simply be a promise to self, but it might also be a promise to a divinity or an elder in the community or some ideal. The core concept of a spiritual discipline is to pursue a path that liberates oneself from the rational, from the everyday, and especially from the rationalizations that we use to justify all kinds of action. It's designed to connect us more deeply and more closely with whatever it is that we hold most dear. And the implication is that promises made only with the head are not really worth the paper on which they are printed. It is the only the heart promise that stands a chance of lasting and reshaping a life. And that's a key thought. I've read, and I'm sure you have, that health clubs and gyms make most of their money in the first three months of the year, right after New Year's, as people pony up to support their New Year's resolutions. In that first quarter, the, cloud, the clubs are crowded with newbies and returnees, and the regulars just have to kind of grin and bear it for a while and line up for pieces of equipment and dream of April when they all go away again and things get back to normal. The promises we make, therefore, with our heads that we make, therefore, are often should promises imposed upon us or sometimes imposed by us because we should do things, ought to do things differently. We ought to get healthier. We ought to eat less. We ought to spend more wisely. We ought to call our mamas weekly. We ought to go to church more often. Okay, that's a good one. They really aren't promises. Most of the time, those are things that are made with the head, not the heart. And for all we pay homage to our mighty brains, it is the least useful organ for keeping promises. The brain is not trustworthy. I know. I've made a gabillion promises with my brain that have gone nowhere because I know I have the ability to think my way out of a promise just as quickly as I think my way into a promise. Maybe that's just me. Maybe I am the only person on earth capable of talking myself into and out of things on an almost hourly basis, but I kind of don't think so. The brain is not that trustworthy. No, I think, I think real willpower comes from somewhere else. Maybe it's the heart. Maybe it's the whole body. If I were more traditional in my religious thinking, I might give credit to Allah or to God or some kind of divine grace that suffuses us and gives us deeper strength and resolve. Perhaps that is the answer. Maybe prayer does work for you as it does for so many. I simply don't know. That's a decision I have to leave with you. That's our Unitarian way. You have to decide your own faith questions. I have a different approach that doesn't actually involve prayer. I bet that if each of us quietly looks inside, we can recall a time when we had to make some kind of life-changing decision, something that took real courage, something that caused us to fight against the currents in which we swim. We might have made a long list of pros and cons before making our decision, but in the end, the decision isn't made in the head. It's made in a more holistic way. And I often joke, except it's not a joke, that when I have a difficult decision, I lay out all those famous pros and cons, and, and if things are still not clear to me, I flip a coin. Head is choice A, tails is choice B. But here's the trick. I never look at the coin when it lands. I give it a really good jump. And while in midair, I pay attention to the voice inside my head that starts shouting, Tails! Let it be tails! Let it be tails! Because I know which promise I want to make. I just have to get out of the way of my own heart. It may sound silly and whimsical, but for me, it isn't. It works. 
Frankly, it's what brought me to this congregation 21 years ago. Thank you. Checks in the mail. It's a way of finding out what promise I'm actually willing to keep, what change in life I'm ready to accept and embrace. And for me, it works. As Leanne LaRoya wrote in our reading, promise is a big word. It either makes something or it breaks something. As for the list of promises, she posts, here's as, as good a one as any. I suspect each of us can find something in that list that strikes us strongly, either because it's a promise we've already been keeping or it's one that we are ready to be keeping. I feel good about number one, for example. I promise myself that I will accept my strengths as well as my flaws. I think I do that pretty well. I still think pretty well of myself, but I understand that I am far from perfect and it doesn't bother me that much. I might not care in the moment if any of you point out my flaws, but I will think about them and take them seriously and eventually grow comfortable with them and do something or not. I think it's pretty important to accept ourselves for who we are and not to let the expectations of others weigh on us too heavily. On the other hand, promise number seven has sometimes been a challenge for me. I will not compromise my values for anything. Right. That's a tough one. I'd be flat out lying if I said I was completely successful with that one. For example, I value freedom of speech, but I won't tolerate abusive language, except when I'm not brave enough and I just sit silent and let something pass. Okay, there's a double defeat for my value right away, and I haven't even opened my mouth yet. I would not have to work very hard to come up for a couple of other examples as to how that one's difficult and others on the list. But that's not the point. These are not the list of promises you have to make. Rather, they're a little bit more like our seven principles that guide us in our Unitarian way. These promises don't stand as hard and fast rules, but as suggestions of the kinds of qualities and goals we might want to adopt if we're truly interested in fixing something in our lives. It's a good list to look at now and then, for it reminds us of approaches and qualities that can make our lives and those around us a little better, especially the ones that when you read them go, ping, that's important for you. A final thought is that we should, oh, but it may be 11 promises. What I wanted to say was it may be that 11 promises all at once are a little bit overwhelming. So maybe start simple. Just one. Just pick one. See which one sits comfortably with you and see how you can work on that one. So a final thought is that we should not be too hard on ourselves for failing at keeping at these promises. As Browning famously wrote, Ah, but a man's reach should exceed his grasp. Or what's a heaven for? Amen.